Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here today. I'm grateful for the opportunity of coming today and talking to you about the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state of sex. Because up to that time, only men could vote. And then according to the 15th Amendment, even men could vote, but women could not. Is there some kind of history behind this story? A little bit, yes. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay? Now, I realize that this is a very small screen. This is a very small poster. What this is... This poster is a history of Congress all over the world and when the right for women to vote was introduced in that country. That's what's interesting about this poster because it goes through all kinds of well-known, incredibly women who helped bring about the right to vote in their respective countries. And it goes Afghanistan and Pakistan and India, it, the United States, England, France, Germany. It covers all kinds of countries. And that's why the poster is important. And so what we should have done is just print it and pass it to all of you so you can read it. But that's what that is talking about. Now let's get into some of the stories of what that is about. We're going to start with this woman. This woman's name is Mary Wollstonecraft. She lived from 1757 to 1796. She had a very interesting life because she grew up in a household that encouraged her and her, her sisters to get all the education they could. And she tried to. 1790s really supportive or 1780s and 90s really supportive of letting women not not too much but she did accomplish great things in becoming extremely well read and very knowledgeable and she was to come in and teach her and she was very very intelligent in the early 1790s, she wrote this book. This is why we consider her a figure of women and rights for women. And the reason is because this book, A Vindication for the Rights of Women, it strongly brings out the idea that are women worth, not only can women be educated, they are worth being educated. And see, the debate, well, why educate a woman? She's just going to get married and have kids, and does she need education? Well, yeah, she does. Yes, she does, and has always. And so it becomes very important when she starts talking about women need to be educated. She got married in her mid-30s, and then she ended up marrying an individual, and that, that union produced one little girl. Girl, or her, this, this woman, her mother, died when that little girl was approximately a year old. That little girl grew up and ended up as the author very interesting book, and that book is called Frankenstein. So, she is the mother of the author of Frankenstein, okay? All right, but this book, this book, her book, is a very strong, it's one of the first books that come out in support of rights of women, in support of education of women, in support of encouraging women to actively be involved in society and in culture and even in government. Okay? 
So that's why I'm starting with this book and this woman, because she promoted, early promoted the causes of women. This is Susan B. Anthony. Now, Susan B. Anthony lived virtually the 1800s. I love this quote from Susan B. Anthony. Forget, con forget conventions. Forget what the world thinks of you stepping out of your place. Think your best thoughts. Speak your best word. Work your best works. Looking to your own conscience for approval. What is she trying to tell women? Yeah. To stand up and do your best. And quit worrying about the opinion of others. One of the biggest problems in our world of any time and any space is this. Ladies and gentlemen, number one person that prevents us from a we can and all that we should. Ourselves. And it's still true. Unfortunately, it's still true. She is trying to say, don't worry about that. You go out and find what you want to do, and then you go out and do it. Period. And do the best you can do. That is good advice. That is good advice now. It really, really is. And she is, she has very strong opinions on the world. Now, something else that she said, I really love this. There never complete equality until women help themselves elect law. True. How true? aren't involved in the process are they completely um, supported if they're not involved are they completely supported I would often tell students during election times go out and vote oh I don't want to vote it's too hard it's a mess it's no big yes it is it's so important and this is why if you don't vote you have to complain period that's, that's true today. That is true throughout time. If you don't vote, you can't complain because you haven't done what you can do to try and make a difference. She is trying to say the same thing. She's saying it specifically about women, but she's saying the same thing, and that's still true. Vote. People, get out and get involved in the process and vote. Get yourself informed. Listen to conversations. Listen to debates. Get out and vote and share your opinions. And that's one of the most important rights that we have as Americans. And that is so incredibly important. One of the other people in the 1800s was a woman by the name of Elizabeth Sadie Cady. I, have, I would have girls regard themselves not as adjectives, but as nouns. <laughs> what is she trying to say? Because we know in English, adjectives are the support of us. The nouns are the subject. The nouns are the activity. The nouns are the people in front. She said, don't be, don't be satisfied with standing back and being the support only. Go out and make yourself a part of what's important and be in front of the line. And that's okay. That's perfectly okay. Well, these, these women and this woman, something very important in the 1800s, but let's hear her quote first. She said, I have no idea of submitting tamely to the injustice inflicted on either me or the slave. I oppose it with all the moral powers with which I am endowed. I am no act of passivity, meaning I will not stand back, I will not ignore, I will be out front as part of the discussion. 
I will be involved. And that is a pretty powerful point of view. Now, these women got together and did something incredible. And it is this. On July the 19th of 1848, in a little town in northern New York called Seneca, New York, they created the Seneca Falls Convention. And women from all over came. Now, this is a, one of the pictures that was taken. This is 1848. The cameras had only been around for a short time. Cameras started functioning in 1842 and 43. Okay? So this is an early, early picture. And the fact that we even have the picture is darn impressive. One of the people that was invited to attend, because it was a two-day conference, on the first day, women only. And there were approximately 300 women came. On the second day, opened the doors up to include men. One, there was only one African-American man who attended. And this is you of some of those figures. And this, they're in the middle. The African man in the middle is Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass had been born into slavery in 1818. And he grew up and he in a home in Maryland. And while there, mother of the household felt sorry for this little boy and tried to encourage him to read. And he slowly began to learn how to read. And then her husband found she was teaching a slave to read. He not only beat the wife, he also beat the little boy because it was thought such a waste. He ended up growing up and became well-educated on his own and became an advocate against slavery and, and became an incredible spokesman against slavery. And he, as soon as he heard about this, that women were trying to stand up for their own rights, he asked if he could attend and support and help. Now, this is what he said when he was... In the denial of the rights to participate in the government, not merely the degradation of women and the perpetuation of great injustice happens, but the maintaining and re repudiation of half of the moral and intellectual power of the governments of the world. What is he trying to say? Women are incredibly intelligent. That women have a moral sense of value unlike and much better than men. And that's still true. They understand the importance of what is going on a lot quicker than men do. And she, he is trying to acknowledge that. This tells us a little bit about that Seneca Falls and the declaration of sentiments that come out of that. There were 300 people that attended, including about 40 men who supported women's rights. He spoke in that, at that convention in support of women's rights. 100 people signed the Declaration of Sentiments, 68 women, 32 men. Even in the middle of the 1800s, there were men realizing the real value of women and trying to support the value of women so that the women could accomplish greater things. Beard. And the no hair. This guy is take follicle challenge to a whole new level, doesn't he? <coughs> Can you imagine? His hair is down into here, and then during the day, he wears it tucked inside of his collar. That is not a beard. That is hair on his back that he has inside of his shirt. And that's how he wears it. And that, no, I think it's a dumb. Okay? 
But that's what's going on. This man's name is William Lloyd Garrison. He is a newspaper owner and publisher, and he has he helps bring about all kinds of very interesting things in America as far as helping America understand what is going on in their world. This guy is also credited, before I tell you how he applies what he happens here, he's also credited with a very interesting saying. And that saying is, this guy told America, go west, young man. And you've likely heard that saying he created the saying, and he was encouraging the settlement of the American West, which tremendously changed America as people started to move west. Now, he hears about the convention, and so he goes, and he's invited to speak. And he does. However, this is a political cartoon of the of the, the Seneca can fall. Convention. You have two ladies right in front. You have Stanton and you have Anthony, and they're they're supposedly riding the boat that's going over the falls, and they're leaning to each other and saying, "Hang on, ladies, it's going to be a bumpy ride, but worth it." And how true! And they go clear down to that lake down in there. And it says equality. And you have others behind them that are trying to encourage suffrage and education and all kinds of events, I issues that you're trying to get women to unite to support because you don't accomplish anything unless you get everybody united. And that's what they're trying to show here. Now, Garrison was trying to tell everyone of the importance of supporting women. This political cartoon came out in Garrison's paper. The two men behind the doors are supposedly talking about helping support the rights of women. Do, they, do people those doors always make the best decisions that are most not really that's why this cartoon is very interesting because you've got a woman opening the curtain and trying to show light into the meeting and helping men understand look you need to support for the rights of women you need to help women because they are worth your time. True then, true now. Okay. One of the more interesting women in the 1800s is a woman named Margaret Fuller. This is one thing that she said. If you have knowledge, let others light their candle. That is a wonderful thought. Because if you understand better something, it's a really good idea to share what you know, and to help others, and lift others, and build others. Margaret Fuller also said this. I know all the people in, in, worth knowing in America, and I find no intellect comparable to my own. <laughs> Was she very intelligent? Yes, absolutely. There's no question. Brilliant, brilliant beyond, beyond belief. Um, the only thing I will say to this, besides the fact that she was brilliant, in our lifetime we remember a boxer, a man by the name of Muhammad Ali. And at one time Muhammad Ali said, it ain't brag if it's fact. And here, was she bragging? Yes. Was it factual? Yes, it was. She was that intelligent. And she was with the Transcendental Group, with Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman and all very impressive, important people. And she got married, and her and her husband ended up having one little baby boy. They had gone to Italy to see his family, and they were coming back. 
1850, they were coming back to America on a ship, and just outside New York City, a storm came up and capsized the boat and all drowned. And it's really too bad, because she could have done so much more and lost her life way too young. Do we place much value in Abraham Lincoln? Of course we do. During his presidency, Abraham Lincoln said, I go for all sharing the privileges of government who assist in bearing its burdens, but by no means excluding women. Well, we know he died in 1865. It was a long time yet. It was another 55 years before women got the right to vote. And so did he have something good to say even way back then? Yes. Yes, he did. He did. This is kind of an interesting political cartoon because it shows the continental United States and it appears that a woman holding a torch is walking through the eastern states to uh, through, walking through the western states toward the eastern states, right? Why? Because in the western states, and many of them were territories in the 1800s, in the western states, many of the territories allowed women the right to vote. Way before the states in the eastern part of the country did. For example, Wyoming became a territory in 1869. And one of the first things they did, they passed a law allowing women to vote. In 1891, Wyoming now had enough people to apply to become a state. And so they, it's, it's a big paperwork process, as you can well imagine. And they did all that and turned in all their stuff and wanted to become a, a state of the United States. And Congress said, everything is fine. And let women vote. We won't let you in because of that. Wyoming's response was, we will wait a hundred years if necessary before we will come in without our women. I'm going, whoa, that was kind of impressive. Really, really was impressive. And Wyoming was let in in 1891. All kinds of states, including Arizona, which doesn't become a state, 1912. All of these let women vote. And, but, and she's trying to say all women should vote. And that doesn't happen until 1920. That's why this cartoon is really a very interesting political cartoon. You know something of the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty initially is going to be a gift from a man by the name of Bartholde who designed it and was building it and he was trying to get the French government to help support him and finance him. They didn't want to. So what did Bartholde do? He built parts of it and put it on display. And one of the parts is that he came over to America and the part of the statue from here in the right hand, from here up where she's holding the torch, that piece was brought to America and it was put on display in Philadelphia and people could come and see it they could climb clear up inside it and look out. And all you had to do was pay 50 cents to do that. And all the money was given to Bartholde to help finance the statue. And then the rest of the statue financing got taken care of by Joseph Pulitzer, the publisher, the newspaper publisher. Pulitzer agreed if anybody building of the statue, even one penny, he would put your name in the newspaper. And so everybody started donating because they got to see their name in print in the newspaper. Finally, the statue gets built. And it gets, it's built in France. It's built in pieces. 
and they bring the pieces over to America. And in 1880, they assembled the pieces of New York Liberty Island out there in the big, just outside of New York City, and they, they put it all together, and then in 1886, they dedicated the statue. Only two women attended the dedication, which is absolute nonsense. Why weren't women invited to attend? The only women that were invited to attend was Mrs. Bartholde, the, the, the uh, inventor, creators, obviously, and the niece of the man, 13-year-old girl that was the niece of the man who designed the base. They were invited. No other women were invited, and the suffrage movement went nuts over this, as well they should, saying, look, you've got Lady Liberty, and you won't let us come and be a part of that? That was crazy, absolutely crazy. But that happened at the dedication of the Statue of Liberty, which I've always thought was hard to even understand. Now, this is the man and his and a man and a woman. They are not married. They are the members of the Wyoming legislature that they helped promote the cause of women. They are the reasons why Wyoming as early as 1869, passed a law that would allow women to vote. And I've always thought that that is pretty darn impressive because you weren't seeing that around. You really, really weren't. Were women in trying to get the right to vote? Of course they were. Of course we were voters out west, rights here in the east. Why can I not vote just because I've moved east? And, and there were lots of protests and movements going on trying to help bring about the rights of women to vote. In 1913, in Washington, D.C., there was a huge program on women's suffrage. And this, this page is actually the front page of the program itself. And that's why I put it in here with that date. And it was an interesting time because in 12 election, Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic Party candidate, or Roosevelt, the Bull Moose Party candidate, don't you love that name? The Bull Moose Party candidate both campaigned on getting the women the right to vote. And Wilson won and got in office and nothing happened. Anytime soon. Does, do, does that ever, is that ever true about Congress <laughs> or a president? They will come out and campaign and promise to do anything imaginable. All you need to do is vote for them. And then they will go to Washington and they will change everything. Have we ever heard that before? And we will get the government to understand that we want every... Really? Really? And so we vote for them, and they go to Washington, D.C., and they become tone deaf over what we want, seemingly. And that's not all completely true, but it sure seems to happen a lot, doesn't it? Now, people got elected in 1912 on the right of women to vote, and it didn't seem to change much right away. So you start seeing signs like this. Mr. President, how, my, how long must women wait for liberty? Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? And as important as this issue is, in all fairness to Wilson, in August of 1914, his wife died. And he... And in between, he was elected in 1912. His wife died in 1914. In that time frame, all three of his daughters got married. And they all had held receptions in the White House. 
And if your father was the President of the United States, wouldn't you want to hold the reception in the White House? Of course you would. Was he a little busy in addition to running the government? Yeah, yeah, he was. He was. And he ended up marrying another woman, a woman by the name of Edith Galt Wilson. He married her in the spring of 19. And so he was single for a little over a year, almost a year and a half. And he ended up getting married. But then in 1916, in the election, he's running again. And he's campaigning again for the rights of women to vote. And, they, and the response was, well, fine, but didn't you say that before? And how come nothing has happened? Do, can't, do politicians have short memories? Seemingly. And he committed that they would get more done. And they were. He was elected. He was elected in the 1916 election. This is just outside of Washington, D.C. in Maryland, a sign that talks about women's suffrage. And it says, Before the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, American women were not guaranteed the right to vote. The American... The National American Women's Suffrage Organization organized a large parade in Washington, D.C. on March 1913. And on February the 12th, a group of women called the Army of the Hudson, I love that, began marching from New York City to Washington, D.C. They were met by, cap by supporters at Overlay Town Hall, which is in Maryland, on February the 23rd, after a journey of 230 miles, would you want to walk 230 miles? That, that sounds a little brave. They joined a parade of 8,000 people bringing national attention to the rights of women. And so there was lots of effort going on in the 19 teens to try and get women the right to vote. <clears throat> and Wilson is trying to say, I am still for women's rights and women's suffrage. And that's what this political cartoon is about. This was one of the political cartoons in during World War I. And it's me, meaning women. To work beside you, fight beside you, and die beside you. Let us vote beside Vote for the candidates for the legislature who stand for women's suffrage. And in the picture is showing a woman working in a munitions factory. We're trying to show, look, we're doing everything we're supposed to do. We need to have the right to vote. That is only fair. That is only right. of 1920. What had happened in 1919, Congress had passed the law that brought about what would hope to be the 19th Amendment, which would give women the right to vote. However, you have 48 states and 36 of the states have got the law within their state legislature ratifying that they are agreeing. And so it went around to different states and in August of 1920, Tennessee voted and became the 36th state to vote. And that's why the amendment was actually declared an amendment. Because 36 of the 48, or three-fourths, and that's what the, con what the Constitution says, three-fourths have to ratify. And they did. And so then that morning, Solon's or congressman ratify and states ratify the suffrage amendment that is in Wyoming this one is in Seattle and I just love the way this one this women right is trying to announce to the world we finally have achieved what we're after now I've loved this quote this one is from Mahatma Gandhi and Gandhi said a very thing about the rights of women. He said, to call the women the weaker sex is a libel, meaning untrue. 
It is man's injustice to woman. If by strength is meant moral power, then women are immeasurably men's superior. And what a beautiful, beautiful thought. This is a quote from Nelson Mandela. Freedom cannot be achieved unless the women have been emancipated in, from all forms of oppression. How incredibly, incredibly true. This one was the first election that allowed women to vote, and that was in the November election of 1920. And this is an advertisement. We give our work, our men, our lives if need be. Give us the vote. Vote for women's suffrage and all the candidates appropriately. And they're trying to show the importance of what women could do and the difference they could make. Were women always appreciated in the fight to get women's rights? This doesn't show that at all. And lots of people thought if a woman is going to be compl complaining, she should be tied up and her mouth closed. Is that fair or right? No. No, not at all. And they've even put a weight on her, and it looks like they're going to just drop her into the ocean or something. But that was one of the political cartoons that against women's suffrage or the right to vote. Now, what is the 19 the is all about? It was passed by Congress on June the 4th, 1919. Fight on June on August the 18th, 1920. It took years of civil protesting and disobedience to get this bill passed. It took all kinds of time to get women the right to vote. Because as just a little bit of history I've given you, it took all of the history of our country clear up to 1920 to try and make it happen. I find this fascinating. I told you that that became the 36th state to ratify. 50 years later, Georgia on it. In 1970, Georgia's legislature passed and ratified the 19th Amendment. I want to go back in time and say, why bother? <laughs> you know, it's, it's already part of it. But I, I better late than never, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I've just found this absolutely hilarious when I found this slide going, are you kidding? Really? I was just my face. This is one of the most touching pictures ever. In 2014, Afghanistan, women for the first time ever had the right to vote. And how you did it was you went to the polling booth and they opened up a little ink pad and you took your right index finger and rolled it in the ink and put it and touched where you were voting. And then the women walked around going. <laughs> and what an incredible thing to see happen because those Afghan women never thought it was going to happen in their lifetimes. And it happened in 2014. And this is one of many pictures of that incredible event. I love this one. And if you've ever been a woman or if you've ever been married to a woman, you'll understand this one. I do. National suffrage. She is frantically trying to finish all the buttons, and along the bottom it says, the last few buttons are always the hardest. Isn't that the truth? Trying to get some idiot puts all the buttons on the backside, trying to get all the buttons together. Just a political in the summer of 1920 that they were trying to encourage the last few states to ratify and vote for the right to vote. 
so that women could actually vote. And it was a delightful little political cartoon to kind of help us understand, was this an easy thing to pass? No, it was not. It was very, very difficult. And generations of women, and in some cases, many good men were strongly involved in trying to get the rights for women to be able to vote and be a part of the political process. And see, all of our lives, that's always been true. And so to us, it's not nearly the issue. The issue now is to convince the younger generation, get off your back ends and vote. Go out and vote because people way who literally gave their lives to get you the opportunity to vote. So do so and make a difference and be a part of all of that. And it is such an important part of the process of who we are as Americans. It really, really is. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just grateful that you could be here today and hear about the 19th Amendment, and thank you for coming here and being a part of all of this.